Recording in progress. Thank you, automated voice. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for telling us what's happening. Hi and welcome everyone. Um, this is the Staten Island edition of Brooklyn Bookends, um, hosted by the Alice Austin House, which is a historic house which represents the life and work of Victorian lesbian photographer Alice Austin. We're located on the waterfront of the North Shore of Staten Island and from the many different kinds of art forms that we present, one of our priorities is supporting and creating platforms for Staten Island poets. Um, it's something that we integrate, poetry is integrated into all of our education programs. The written word is extraordinary and powerful. And tonight we're joined by an amazing uh, set of poets and um, we're so lucky to once again have tonight be hosted by Staten Island poet Thomas Focolaro. Um, I should mention that my name's Victoria Munro. I'm the executive director of the Alice Austin House and uh, a huge poetry fan. Um, so I am going to hand it over to Thomas this evening. Please be uh, aware of muting yourself while others are speaking. Um, don't be afraid to participate when invited to, of course. And if you had a question, you can always put it in the chat. Um, but just enjoy this evening. I know we'll have people joining us a little bit later. One of our other co-hosts, which Thomas will talk about and introduce as well. Um, but I deeply thank the poets for joining us tonight. And um, as I said in the chat, we are being recorded so that we can share this more widely with people that might not be quite home from work yet and would love to see this wonderful, wonderful work. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Thomas and let you experience some Staten Island poetry magic this evening. All right, thank you so much, Victoria. And thank you again, Alice Austin House, for always supporting poetry on Staten Island. Uh, that's not always something uh, that is done, and we truly, truly appreciate that. Um, what I'm going to be doing, if you're not muted, I'm going to mute you now, because I have the power, the hosting power. I can mute and unmute. I could change the rectangles. It's a very, you know, I'm on a power trip tonight, so um, um, it's just going to be that way. Um, please make sure to tip your bartender and, oh no, we're, we're not doing that today. Uh, we're actually in uh, the, we're either in our homes, our domiciles, our workplaces. Uh, Zoom allows us uh, to do that where we can commute right from our couch to our desk and do some poetry. We have six amazing poets tonight. I'm gonna be hosting the first half of the show and then Matthew Figgs is gonna be hosting the second half of the show. Um, um, my uh, poetry partner in rhyme. I'm also going to be trying to put in the chat room, you know, a, a bunch of poets have chapbooks or books. So I'm going to put links uh, uh, to their books in the chat in case you're interested. And our first poet up uh, has uh, uh, an amazing chapbook, Tidal Wave, uh, that I'll be putting um, uh, in the chat space. I'm not sure if they have anything new coming down the pike. If they do, uh, if they want to send me that link, uh, uh, I definitely will share that too. But here is Kofi Antu. Thank you, thank you, Thomas. <clears throat> thank you, Thomas, for um, always saving space for us uh, Staten Island poets. It's greatly appreciated. And thank you, Brooklyn Bookend, and thank you, Alice Austin House. Um, this is greatly needed for poets. Um, I love to read my poetry in front of uh, friends and colleagues. So doing this virtually gives me this opportunity to spread some of my poems. So tonight um, I'm reading some of my newer work and some, some prose, some poetry. Um, let me not waste too much time and let's just get started. So the first poem that I'm going to read tonight is titled A Letter to Martin. Deepen the ugly process of deprivation of waste. Martin had a dream with Allah as witness we shall see it through. And Gina, not my mama's biscuits or stories of horticulture's 
perseverance and bloom. By spring and summer, thorns reveal such flamboyant descriptions of death. Some are white, some sing poems to me, others are doomed by an island. We separate from things that no longer serve us. My skin as smooth as shea butter, baby number two is inclined to see us. Much sooner than we think four letters will save us. Secrets are like friends and family living within chaos. I have what is essential. I am a kid to God, a son of Jehovah. Rest in its benevolence. The evening sun perches my skin. A mother calls out. A father says goodbye. So the next poem that I'm going to read tonight is titled The Lord's Prayer. Um, this poem is special to me, just like most of my poems. This poem was accepted by Stone Canoe, which is um, a publication presented from the YMCA down at um, Central New York. So let's begin. The Lord's Prayer. Behind the bench, street walkers bypass occupants inside cars. Trucks matter in space, calculates distance seems to separate us. People are debating by a vacant church building. The roof weathered blue like Lady Liberty. There are windows here. An idle bench occupies a man flaring arms towards us. He sits silently. Violence seems to be a form of communication. Back to the wall, a building stands stone, cold. Steve could be a name. A name is to kinships of beginnings. Today, his legs bend by the crease of dawn, perplexed. I watch him live beneath us, our land a field, dusty green grass. It stops there behind grandma's kitchen, mint replenished tiny gardens. Through a window, I see him. Hopefully we exchange sites of acknowledgments. A poem reveals syntax, breaks in line placements, begin to develop voices embedded in heads of crazy ones. I've overheard Exhibit Z speak out of his bottled up hands. Between us, a net collects time and dust. A street cat hisses, the older cat mingles aimlessly. By the lobby, like us, they are looking for a good time. All right, let me read another poem or two that I have. Um, this poem is titled Fight Night. I'm a lover of boxer, boxing, I should say. Um, and while I was watching a boxing, fight, I want to say last year, I was just looking at each individual or each boxer, thinking about the preparation that they put into their sport. So this poem was birthed through that, um, that boxing match. <clears throat> fight night. The lights are deafening. Cheers will ring out like vengeance will be spilled. The thirst of blood circles splatters a southpaw or orthodox, jabs and faints and finds self inside, an opponent, side, flesh will tear, one's limb will succumb to nothingness like sea salt, a tidal wave submission into a relentless ocean, a lightning left hook will shatter a contender's championship, dreams are for losers and winning is for the, cele the celebrated warriors. Fans will brag about their favorite fighters, fluent beatdowns, loose losses will haunt like the 13th of midnight. An announcer's roars, let's get it on. Like Al Green's tenderness, the winner confronts a giant in question. All right, I'm working my way towards the end of my reading. I have two more poems. Thomas, is that enough time for me? Okay, so let me just take a little bit of water. Give me a moment. To my wife, Alicia, say yes. 
elongated nights in a cry, like devils have recounted footsteps and villages, like Fonte women's breasts squeezing life by the horns. Say it under fainted breath, fleeted. Fame is not for the weak, end it here with a period, or no, but first speak of it like God has ordained ministry to reap benefits of communications, yes. Know what makes bones tremble and weakened limbs, tyranny. Go together like opposites attract. Windows into a glass house, we see you. So I have my last poem for the day, uh, for the night I should say. Um, so this poem I've been working on back and forth some time now, I feel real comfortable with it. I believe this, um, this poem has opened up my new collection of poetry that I'm working on. Uh, hopefully I should have some more news about when this, this uh, collection of poems will be uh, published. Dear elected official, man walks on moon. Gender is a construct created by leaders of the imperialists, man awaits his trial date. Man, fighting against state, city and union, conflated memories, distant brothers sending letters recoils the heart. Man sits and waits. Actually, man is the case. Trial number 911, 911. Please come save us. Or man, trial begins awkwardly, defending now dependent on instructional disciplinary actions, is up against a tsunami of lies, facts. A brother tilts his cap backwards, facts. Let a brother go, scream, shout, jump. They won't release man from physical and mental purgatory. Prosecutors, reminds man he's an animal, the one that needs to be studied, detained and ruthless, lifeless. Forget about it all. Him, baby, man isn't coming home anytime soon. The church won't miss him either. Societal wounds harms its most beautiful creatures. An animal, a mammal, an insect scurries a canvas. Artists are broken into many little pieces. Fundamentally sound, craftsmen work are aligned with government funding. Man, oh man. Factually, there are hidden agendas placed to limit the dreamer. Fleeting, love is a four letter word most would never see outside of a prison. Imprisoned by law abiding citizens. Man, too much gin, man, too much fun, man, too much conspiring instead of living in a dainty perfection. Brother man is working on a manifesto, his pillow a hard steel floor. Once boy, now man, bewildered. He prays, now prayed, finds no use of religion, throws it in the garbage. Man is walking on the moon. Satan is a devil worshiper's ally. Raise the bar and men will find another route inside. A mesh hall gets dirty, dirty like Southern discomfort. Man walks back to his cell. Man thinks about all the things he did right as a child. Childless, lonely, creator, creator introduces a counterpart. Woman, cherry red lipstick screams vanity. The guard bangs on cell door, allows his keys to serenade the man, the madman to sleep. There's no sleepless evenings of American dreams. Reality is frightening. Motion to the motionless. I'm sorry, your honor. Saddened by yesterday's pledge. A man is caged by his own thoughts. Tomorrow isn't promised. A DJ produces and breaks records. From the hood to Hollywood, hollow tips are likely chapters of a new, newsworthy mention. Nurture versus nature versus humanity versus God versus love. What comes next? Man, realization hits like a blunt. Man waited too long to plead guilty. Man pleads guilty. There's no more doors to escape or windows to crawl out of. Light chambers peeked past his cell. Trial was over be before it began. Like cheap suits worn on guilty defendants. Man.
Thank you, everyone. All right, let's hear it for Kofi Antwi. Wow, that was incredible. Uh, please, again, uh, Kofi's chapbook is in the chat room. If you don't have it, you should please check it out. Um, our next poet has a chapbook, uh, Post-it Saved My Life, but I don't think you can order it online right now. I think it's sold out online, but I'm sure if you DM them, they'll either send you the book or they'll just send you an envelope full of post-its. I don't know. <laughs> but you definitely could. I do, I do have some more copies. Uh, if anybody wants one, you're welcome to reach out to me. Um, and uh, I also just want to say, um, instead of me turning my camera every time I have a cigarette, just know that if I'm not on camera, I'm still here. I'm still listening to you. I'm just feeding my nicotine addiction. I have a poem about that. Um, uh, my first one is about the work that I've been doing and it's been really difficult and I hate emails. Like I hate, I hate them now. Um, I, I, I never want to receive another one ever again. And so I didn't write the last stanza of this poem. I have to confess that the last stanza of this poem is taken strictly from Twitter and internet memes. Um, and I take ownership of that. It's called, I hope this email does not find you. Dear fiscal intermediary, I apologize for the delayed response. Here is the updated psychological evaluation you requested. I am so sorry this took so long. I lay prostrate before you awaiting punishment. Please return my charred corpse to the next of kin. Sincerely, Julie Benson, caseworker at Assholes Incorporated. I can't figure out where it says on my resume, hurt me more, daddy, hit me harder. Dear Assholes Incorporated, I hope this email finds you dancing to the hideous piping of forbidden flutes. I wanted to bring to your omniscient attention that I shall not be attending Employee Appreciation Day so that I can sit around choking on your pretentious bullshit while being engulfed in the background thoughts of 500 other people who also do not want to be there. Reply to another email, apologize again. Take a shot of whiskey, apologize again. Have one more cigarette before I call a grieving mother to ask for a copy of the death certificate for her four-year-old child because Assholes Incorporated requires it to complete the disenrollment process. Her child's name is already missing from my database and I was advised not to bill for this. Good afternoon and happy Wednesday. I hope this email finds you bruised but mending in a temple of serpents. I apologize for the delay of our crucial collective catharsis. Sincerely and eternally yours in shared existential torture, Julie Benson, caseworker at Assholes Incorporated. I hope this email does not find you. I hope your chair has grown over with moss. I hope a pleasant but unobserved beam of light hits your desk through the collapsed ceiling. I hope the silence is deafening. I hope this email does not find you. I hope that you've escaped and that you are now free. All right. It's so weird. It's so weird not hearing any sound when one is done with the poem, but it's okay. It's all right, we will continue. Um, so speaking, uh, speaking about smoking, <clears throat> which is something I really need to stop doing. <clears throat> this poem is called Cessation. I need to stop mansplaining to doctors. I need to get off Facebook. No screens for at least an hour before sleep. God, I need a cigarette. God, I need to stop smoking. All of the cartoon characters inside of my head look down at me with their arms crossed, waiting. I'm running away, down a long stonework hallway lined with the statues of every demigod that I ever worshiped. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles are there, except 
they're 5,000 feet tall and carved from pure onyx. And when they walk, they make no sound. I need to stop hitting doctors with mountains. Complexes look so small when they're not yours. God, I need to stop sitting in doctor's offices, psych explaining to them that smoking has nothing to do with a lack of intelligence and everything to do with self-punishment and giant onyx statues. I need to stop watching the Ninja Turtles and go to sleep. Get my ears zapped, undergo hypnosis and electroshock therapy for good measure. I need to stop cheating myself out of my own lessons. I need to stop trying. I need to stop lying to my gynecologist in order to keep getting birth control. And the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles need to stop writing scripts for Wellbutrin. And poets need to stop poet-splaining to doctors about self-punishment. Doctors need to stop reducing the mind to the brain, and the brain needs to stop allowing this reduction. I need to stop running and I need to stop coughing, but those lashes feel so right. Giant onyx statues need to stop being right. And everyone needs to stop telling me to quit smoking. And by everyone, I mean doctors. The Ninja Turtles keep buying me cigarettes and I keep reciting poetry to them about smoking cessation. The me, in a parallel universe who was able to quit is sitting in a parallel doctor's office and interdimensional explaining to that doctor how self-punishment can be so nostalgic and familiar, the demon that you know. No one knows me like giant onyx statues, silently dancing this cycle of fear, lashes, and self-flagellation I need a fresh start. I need to start thinking of new tortures. I got one more for you guys. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old one, but I don't know. It song sounds sweet to me today, so I'm bringing it out again. Um, this poem is deceptively titled Broken. When I was three years old, I learned that figures with gas masks and goggles were people. I watched the story of a girl growing up a thousand years from now where people had evolved so far and for so long that pure air and water would kill them. For hundreds of years, the forest soaked up the pollution that we're making now. And there used to be horses. There used to be skyscrapers and cars and, and sidewalks. I am a sidewalk being broken up by the tree roots so that the light can come in. Tree roots taught me how to move with slow deliberateness, to move under the surface. I am a three-year-old wearing a gas mask. When I see tree limbs break apart chain link fences, I get excited. Sunshine beams into abandoned super malls and mega churches, and my lizard cheerleaders are swimming figure eights through the open doors of submerged cars. Here comes the water. Ashes to ashes, rust to rust, swing open my rib cage to the ruins of cities overrun with trees. I am the gas mask on your great great grandchild's face. The skeletons and lizard cheerleaders join hands, swimming in patterns that form inner and outer mandalas, a geometric tribute to Homo sapiens, the former species that cut down trees and repaired broken sidewalks with delusional white knuckled reinforcement of their supposed dominance. They didn't understand that broken is the only way to let the light in. Thank you, everyone. Let's hear it for Julie the Loon. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. Again, uh, DM them uh, if you want uh, their chat book, uh, uh, Post-it Notes Saved My Life. Um, and yeah, please, you know, we, you know, as Julie mentioned, 
you know, there's no applause, but there is that little chat space. If you like lines that you like or anything like that, just throw them in there. It makes the poet feel so much better. Artificial. I am gushing right now. Thank you, everybody. Oh my God. Um, we are gonna move on to the next poet. Uh, this next poet um, is actually hosting the second half of this. Um, they also have a book uh, of poetry called Adolescence uh, that I'm gonna be uh, uh, I'm putting the link in the chat room. If you don't have it, you should definitely check it out. Here is Matt Figs. Thank you, y'all. Happy to be here. Sorry for what I missed in the beginning, but um, yeah, love the arts. So I have uh, two poems I'm going to do, one shorter um, and one little longer, both of them kind of newish. I always wrote myself as the hero, hoping to erase how I always felt zero by building up accolades in the grandest way. Doesn't matter what transpired, the pen gives me the final say. Don't even care if you were there. Don't even care if it's about you. The page is the place where my word is law, where I determine what's true. Some poets are beautiful and some are selfish. Shelling out words they sell as courage, perpetrating personas to hide within. Man, I swore this pen made me different. Thought I was wielding a sword, every filled notebook a testament to the war y'all mortals ain't aware of. That's the danger of being a poet when you're the only one deciding what is or isn't true, how can the deepest beauties of the world ever hope to reach you? How will controversy ever teach you? How will love ever lead you? Shit, how will you ever really be able to see you? Some poets are like groundhogs scared of their shadows, out there fighting every war we can to avoid battling the wars within. Thank you. Um, all right, here's this other one. And I guess, yeah, that one, I felt like a little personal because I felt like for a long time, I was writing about things that were hard and I felt like that was facing them but it was really just writing, but not actually doing anything with it. So like, that's a great first step, but then there was no, you know, change or growth. Um, and it's, I guess it's, it's a hard place where artists, I feel like get trapped in sometimes. Uh, all right, and this next one is called Ascension. I thought Ascension meant leaving it all behind, being better than, Supreme being beamed up to the top of some mountain above the follies of man. The only worthy metamorphosis affects your surroundings. My win is your win type shit. That's why they're called gifts. True philosopher stone is the human spirit. So I ask you, alchemist, what are you willing to put into it? I thought ascension meant leaving this cursed dimension when it's more like healing life's lemons or the blessings. I sought powerful men, hoping to learn their wizarding ways, searching for the spell that'll keep me safe, running, running. When, but when fear is your compass, there is no escape. True magic lay in naming the thing, reframing whatever brings you to the brink as more paper, as more ink. Make it a comedy. Take a step back, laugh at the ridiculous cast. The past isn't carnivorous, it's actually your greatest friend. Peculiar proof that nothing lasts. Just cause we can't predict the plot twists, does it mean we ain't writing the script? 
my previous nemesis, Juan Carlos the 87th, taught me the power of perception. No matter the wily coyote antics, he was immune to my vengeance. When I paid a garage rock band to jam on his lawn at 4 a.m., this clown came out singing. When I drenched every inch of his favorite suit in slime, he smiled and volunteered at a haunted house. When the bees hidden beneath his sink went bananas on his face, he went live on IG, laughing through the swelling, how he was sweeter than honey. Finally, exasperated, I put my hands on him, dragged that sip to a seaside warehouse, suspended him by his ankles above a shark tank encircled by a snake while a speaker blasted secrets from his diary to a live studio audience. It was perfect. Juan Carlos, the 87th head turned tomato red as blood rushed to it. I leaned forward, praying for some whimpers. Instead, this motherfucker thanked me. OMG, he exclaimed. I must be blessed for someone to go to such extravagant lengths for little old me. His eyes widened in admiration and his lips twisted into a disgustingly warm smile. How can I hate someone who refuses to do this dance with me. I once defined power as something that sets you apart from others, like God and heaven. I once defined power as plowing through life's BS to find pleasure. True power is in connection, true power is no matter how the script and even the actors flip, still gazing upon the world and singing to the sweet lullaby of love like Juan Carlos. I thought ascension was only about the benefits. It's not about what we get. It's about what we're willing to give. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, guys. Oh, you guys are sweet. Um, okay, so I am going to pass it off to our next amazing poet. Many of you guys know him. His booming voice can be heard all across the boroughs, no matter where he's performing. He also has, a, I think, another chat book that just came out. I think it's about to be released. Um, it came up with the name of the sick cover art. As soon as it's available, please go I'll grab your copies. Up next, Thomas Hukalaro. No, sorry, name is gardening is what I do when I give up. Thank you for putting it into the chat. Yeah, no problem. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, this, uh, uh, First poem, you know, we all do a lot of open mics, I'm sure uh, we all do, but there is a specific open kind of open micer um, that, well, anyway, um, here we go. Beating someone over the head at an open mic with their own guitar, a performance art piece. What we do for art requires someone else's sacrifice. Always a trim Jesus strung up on some song splintering. Before you approach said trim Jesus, you should close your eyes, lashes like arthropod legs, an open four-eyed creature of habit and howl and entitlement. If they have one of those harmonica holder 
things, that is a bonus for it truly has a handle to it. Sing with the chorus as your spider-legged eyes web frets like some old-timey museum gladiator art piece for the sake of fists. Grab their guitar, yell, the host said five minutes, or your troll voice trites petty and smash their guitar into their vocalized noggin. Then I paint their nails, buy them a beer, tell them that my parents trashed my dreams too. Don't forget, this is my performance art piece. All right, fantastic. Always good to start off with violence. Um, here we go. Performing, suicide, prevention, poems at a Starbucks. Can't help but feel lost and highly caffeinated as the host keeps telling everyone to stay. There is a big exit sign overhead staring at us. My heart palpitates, a coffee bean stuck in my aorta, a passerby stuck in a mist of pretension and suicide prevention apparel. Our clothes save lives, made by smaller lives who have no time for taking a bolt of lightning hits everything but this Starbucks. They give you a free plastic cup so you will return the music upright and totaled from the inside. I feel lost. So to deflect that action, I will hate on this group who are trying to become lightning and spark something different than vitriol. The host quizzes the audience with mental health questions. If my mental health is riding the tracks going 8,000 miles an hour, when will it arrive? A, in the morning, B, in the afternoon, C, in the evening, or D, all of the above. All right, I have two more poems. Uh, that unfortunately was a true story. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep it going. This is a palindrome which you read forwards and backwards. I'm probably only gonna just read it forwards just for the sake of time. Hyphens. You start writing breakup poems before the breakup. You box everything up in your head it is said if a writer loves you, you can never die. It is said if a writer loves you, you will always die by their pen. All these crazy and vindictive poetic lines come to mind that make no sense. You hear Alice Walker, man corrupt everything. As you scream into a beyond too far out of your reach for it to meet mean anything. Good breakup poetry requires a bad breakup. I can't remember a time where I didn't write good breakup poetry, like some encouragement gift box self-care spa set, like some disturbing painting that is hanging above your mind, like you are no longer a concern anymore, like pink diamonds buried in horseshit like poems photoshopped on Getty images landscaped, like the sickle blade in full flower. I could write the most heartbreaking breakup poem in case you or someone close to you needs it. I keep a quart of blood frozen in my freezer. And I have one more poem for you. Thank you for letting me spit at the screen um, towards you. Um, I do have a chapbook. The only guarding I do is when I give up. Um, 
where would a Tom, you know, Matt was talking about, uh, did a fir his first poem, like being stuck in a space, where would we be without Thomas doing a mommy poem? Um, and this is kind of my origin story. This poem is about how I enter a room. I'm from ketchup sandwiches and cigarette smoke, pajama bottoms and broken insults, beer can teeth and three-limbed care bears. You could feel the broken on my one sock. Dear barstool table, I won't know you for another 15 years, but I understand how it feels to always have something stuck to the base of you that has been in somebody else's mouth. Dear George Carlin, my mother introduced me to you at a very young age. You showed me that God was too slow in proving it was real, but you also made me laugh too. My mother was quite the comedian herself. When I was three years old, my mother drove her beige Chrysler like some sort of 80s midlife middle crisis and parked it in the lawn of the house where my father was having an affair and just left it there. I think this is how I approach all of my poetry. How do you create space without taking up too much space, like the Chrysler? I am from my mother, smoked cigarettes while I was in her tummy. God was a matter of fact, a matter of lungs digested. My poems, they laugh at me. I have become the comedian. Dear God, why is your light always laughing at me? I am from C-section and needs more oxygen. How we open up depends on the arch of our back and the blade. When they opened my mother up, they found me. I have my mother's smile and she has the scar to prove it. Thanks. Man, that was that was a great ending. That last line. Thank you for sharing that. You know, and we'll we'll always always hear. Um, up next is someone that I'm very happy to introduce. I've been trying to hear her perform for a while, but she's always involved in the community, um, not only in her own personal work, um, but also with different organizing like Geek Out at Staten Island. Um, she's a great spirit, and a lot of her poems come right from the heart and her personal experiences. Please show some love to Naja. Oh, thank you. That was such a sweet intro for me. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Name is Naja. Um, a lot of these poems are from a chapbook I'm still working on, and I say this with like anger more so towards myself, but it finally has a name. It's called uh, The Nor That Doesn't Chatter. Um, nor is Arabic for the light. So basically it's the light that doesn't chatter. Uh, so the first poem is called Sadness Has an Axe. Sadness is slow. It creeps onto your toes while you're trying to fall asleep. You kick it away, but you are not aware of its full presence. You see it as an insignificant thing at your feet because it's actually an invisible beast that emerges the minute your mind doesn't sound like a busy city street. All the sounds of the outside world that you use to block out are silent for a moment. Sadness takes its opportunity to pick at your toes, fingers, until they pick at your heart and your brain, until you wrap yourself in blankets in hopes of protection from it, not knowing you just wrapped yourself in their habitat. That's now yours. This is your new home that you may say, come in, when you mean keep out. That moment your mind is quiet is the most dangerous because nothing is stopping the sound of sadness picking its ax at you, breaking you apart. It breaks from toes to head so you don't notice until it's too late. Until you're looking at pieces of your body detached, all wrapped up in your blanket you thought would protect you. That's the first one. Thank you, thank you. 
This one is new. I wrote it like a couple months ago. It's called Who is Really the Savior? Savior saving savages, but how savage is a savior? Ripping our culture from the roots of our brains like it's a favor. Pillaging communities to get a taste of our flavor. Just to not use the spices in anything you savor. Like the spices that make us, us, is just misbehavior. That temperatures boiled from anger, frustration, and mistrust is just us acting up. That kettles are not allowed to whistle, whether on purpose or by accident, to signify our frustration with a nation that has a standing ovation of our damnation at their hands. Because all that was demanded was basic human treatment. Yet we are the savages seeking saviors, but the savage saviors never looked in the mirror, never stopped to ponder, to wonder, to think that they are not superior saviors, but the very savages that seek the thrilling sensation of saving others are not the, are, are the same ones putting them in danger. Is it just fun trying to get something new to just discard it? Now that is a true savage. So that's the next one. Thank you, thank you. This one I wrote like soups long ago, like 2013, which is not even that long ago, but it sounds long ago. <laughs> it's called Cloudy Skies. <clears throat> Cloudy skies and drifting beings roam the lands. Dead trees and dead hearts cover this space like a harsh blanket. This was poke out of the spines of men while the normal quiver at the bottom of a bathtub, shaking like it's a habit uncontrollable and kept for so long the eyes of the protectors have become old time now they are blind to the dangers amongst them the shadows slip past them like the wind through trees their silent steps and silent grins of vicious hunger stay undetected and then i have just two more got pull them up thank you i can hear the snaps even though i can't hear the snaps i hear the snaps <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing <laughs> visual to audio okay so this one's called steamy tears i like to cry in the heat the tears steam and begin to boil as they roll down my cheek eventually evaporating as though i was never in a state this weak this vulnerable this insecure that I, who has been crying, never existed before. That my sadness never struck me down to the floor, has never broke my heart, bones, and soul. In the heat, everything disappears. Everything fizzles up in flames, leaving nothing of before, nothing of, once, what, oh, nothing of what once came. In the heat, you could pretend your tears are sweat and push through, as you're working hard not to have the scary things of this world seep through get under your surface and creep in. Even the mantle is too deep. In the heat, you can easily fall asleep and forget about your pains, including the days you cry, even though your tears dissipate. And then I just have one last one. It's called Shards of the Shambles. You can't fall, trip or tumble. You aren't amongst the shards of the shambles. You can't allow the reflection of the broken pieces inside you to project outward. Opaque and fake, you must be. The glue you use must be clear. No one must know it's Elmer's, for gorillas are too strong. A crack in your floorboard, an impression in your canvas, a smudge in your mirror, a chip on your shoulder slowly gets worse under other people's vision. It's more manageable when no one knows and the magnifying glass is removed. Take flight despite being featherless. No one knows your wings are invisible but you. Take their blindness and gullibility as shields because often their hearts are only protected by a rib cage, which means they are still holes to poke through no matter how small you make the spaces between them. That's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, please, the second that book is out, please let people know. We we'll love the support. <sighs> All right, y'all. Last up is a brother I have an immense amount of respect for. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have heard him. 
And he has a certain line in one of his poems that he says, I am poetry. And I think that rings true. He has a couple different collective works out. I believe the one available for this festival is an anthology called Arriving at a Shoreline. So please give your love and respect to M.A. Dennis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt Fix. Um, thank you to Brooklyn Book Fest. Thank you to Alice Austin House. And because this is a special event, I decided that I would do something special. So I've crafted something that I'm going to call a poetic prose tapestry. And it's inspired and based on excerpts of the anthology you just mentioned, um, Arriving at a Shoreline, um, published by Great Weather for Media. So I have my first ever short story published in there, which is um, Sand as a Boundary for Sea. And I took some excerpts from that short story and I used that to craft what I'm going to share with you tonight. And to think they call it an act of God. No, if anything, it's an act of Satan. That's why my heart goes out to Satan's wife. According to an old wives tale, the devil's beating her whenever there's a spell of heavy rain and smacks of thunder. So imagine the level of domestic violence that's happening in hell during a hurricane, a superstorm, a Katrina, a Sandy, an Ian. Dear Uncle Ian, I owe you an apology. The sincerest, most heartfelt one I can offer. I apologize for my death wish. I'm sorry for wanting you to drop dead. And all over a video cassette recorder, a now obsolete electronic device. You can't even give away a VCR for free nowadays. What would someone even do with it? No one except for those enamored with 80s nostalgia still possess videotapes. Today, everyone watches movies through streaming services such as Netflix and Hulu. Watching flicks on a machine the size of a lasagna casserole pan is as outdated as performing gyrations with a hula hoop. A modern day gyrator needs no equipment other than their own body Twerking is how they prefer to perform their pelvic thrusts. That was such a long time ago, Uncle Ian. The day you stole our VCR, I was so angry. My mother, your sister, gave me explicit instructions to not let you enter the house under any circumstances. And when you pleaded to use the bathroom, basically crying to be given the dignity to answer nature's call in a toilet instead of the bushes, that was a circumstance I was ill prepared to handle, yet I fought to remain resolute, to obey my mom's edict. Do not, I repeat, do not let your uncle in in this house. But you wore me down. You even went so far as to remind me of the eternal debt I owe to you. Who taught you how to tie your shoelaces, you asked? A question we both already knew the answer to. Me, Uncle Ian, I taught you to tie your shoelaces and now you won't even let me use the bathroom? I let you use the bathroom against the better judgment of an inner voice warning me not to unlock the front door. I loved you, Uncle Ian. Mom said you were on that stuff and couldn't be trusted, but I believed in you. I believed in you telling me, I'm just gonna use the bathroom, nephew, in and out. I promise you won't even know I was here. 10 minutes later, 10 minutes after disobeying the disciplinarian who gave birth to me, it was obvious that Uncle Ian had been here. When I saw the empty space on top of the TV console, outlined by a rectangular dust imprint shaped like a lasagna casserole pan, it was reminiscent of a common graffiti phrase found in public bathrooms. 
pick a name was here. Here's the thing, Uncle Ian. A lot of bad things happened which led up to you being banned from our home. Someone stole our purebred German Shepherd, Queen Sheba, and sold her for $20 to a guy who lived up the block. He refused to give her back. And when my mom told me that the guy who lived up the block had an anger management problem and did prison time for a homicide instigated by an argument over a dog, that was that. Sheba was renamed Bonnie because he wanted to mate her with his pit bull Clyde. When I went to watch my favorite videotape, a sports documentary narrated by Clyde the Glide Frazier, profiling the all-time greatest NBA point guards, the VCR was gone, just like a beloved family pet. And in that perfect storm moment, a moment of being betrayed by my beloved uncle, who I'll forever be indebted to for teaching me how to tie my shoelaces, combined with the looming fear of my mother's wrath due to be home soon from a long, stressful day at the plantation known as work. In that moment of absolute furiosity, I wanted you to die. I wanted that stuff to kill you. How else would you stop terrorizing us? Maybe it's not really about the VCR. Maybe it's about never being able to feel safe, secure. Maybe it's about that stuff bringing the worst out of my uncle Ian. So much so that I was ready to kill him before his time. When I look at my uncle Ian today, healthy, a homeowner, a dog owner, a pillar of his neighborhood. I feel so guilty. I want to apologize. I want to tell him he is a metaphor for hope, that he is a Bob Marley song come to life, a redemption song. Redemption song. Redemption song. Redemption song. Redemption song. Redemption song. I hate to sound like a broken record. But when it comes to dealing with aggressive panhandlers, no matter how many times you say, I don't have it, in different ways, ad nauseum, doesn't matter. I don't have it. I don't got it. I'm broke. All I have is my EBT card. Unless you expose your empty pants pockets like bunny ears, the aggressive panhandler will not take your answer for an answer. No matter how many times you say it like a broken record. I want to go on record and say that the only aggressive profession that irks me more than a panhandler is a preacher. I can't stand an aggressive street corner preacher. There I am, minding my beeswax, my locks, enjoying the indigenous summer breeze blowing as I wait at the bus stop for the B-63 to Sunset Park. And here comes Brother Hector invading my personal space. I don't like people invading my personal space, but I give Brother Hector a pass after he tells me, God spoke to me and said to come speak to you. Who am I to go against God? She's the only one I don't mind invading my personal space. Although I'd rather God come to me directly, if she wants to work through Brother Hector, that's fine. Although Brother Hector annoys me, I'm doing fine until he tries to flip me. He tries to get me to accept Jesus and be born again. I try to be polite and tell him I need time to think about being born again. I was a breach baby, but first, 
Day one, I'm already telling the world, kiss my ass. I almost died by umbilical cord strangulation. Not sure I want to go through that ordeal again of being born. So I tell Brother Hector that I'll gladly take his free religious telemarketing literature, but I can't commit to Jesus today. Brother Hector tells me tomorrow might be too late. And when that doesn't flip me, he resorts to fear tactics. He warns me, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And if you're not saved, you'll burn in hell for all eternity. All I want to do is cuss Brother Hector's ass out. I want to ask him, how hot can hell really be if it takes all eternity for something to burn? I want to tell him my older sister, Dee Dee, she died in an automobile accident. After being run off the highway, her Trans Am hit a concrete divider, caught fire and exploded. She burned to death. My poor parents, they would have preferred to give Dee Dee a traditional burial. Unfortunately, she was already cremated. So, Brother Hector, I'm not afraid of burning in the afterlife. I'm afraid of burning in this life, trapped in a vehicle, roasting like a friggin' $5 Costco rotisserie chicken. But I say none of that to Brother Hector. I simply take his free religious telemarketing literature and board the B-63 bus. And I sit at a window seat and reflect on a recent heartbreak. My girlfriend broke up with me. She wants a man who loves Jesus and has a car. My ex-girlfriend simply cannot fathom why. I refuse to drive. Thank you. Sorry, Peter. No, yeah, that was, yeah. I don't even know, I don't even have words to say for that. Um, <laughs> Thank you all so much for being here, giving us your time, your energy, and your art. Thank you for Alice Austin House uh, for making space for us, Brooklyn Bookends Festival, bringing us together, giving us another chance to, you know, spread the things that we stay up at night writing about, being consumed by, hoping someone will listen to them. But you know, um, so you know, let's get everybody. We'll give our, um, each other some snaps, you know. Um, and it's a great time. And can't wait till the next time we get to hear all your beautiful voices and your hearts. So have a great night. Bye everyone.